Brother Phil, that was beautiful. Yes, you was. Amen. Now, is this mic off? I'm getting an echo. <clears throat> now, Phil didn't know this, but he touched on one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. One of my favorite things to preach on is Genesis 4, 7. It's the moment when God describes sin as crouching at your door. But the scene is God the Father is sitting with Cain before he acts. And he describes what's in his heart, it's in his mind, and he defines sin in his thoughts. And the beautiful moment is, in spite of what God knows about what's going to happen, he shows love, he shows patience, he takes time, he walks and talks it out with his son. But what does Cain do? He's quiet. He says nothing. And he keeps to himself. And when he has opportunity, he acts it out. But in that, as we heard so beautifully, um, God's love was demonstrated. It was explained. It was something that I see throughout carried in the rest of the Scriptures. Patience, love, and always hope. Amen? Amen. Well, today we're not in Genesis. We are in Luke. And a parable that is dear to my heart, because I like to reflect on my life when uh, I talk about this. This is especially one of my favorites to uh, teach the children about prayer. How many of you are the baby in your family? Oh, I'm not alone. Yes. I'm the baby of three. My, my parents have three boys. I am the baby. And I had the pleasure of two older brothers that uh, loved to play with me. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they were rough and tumble, and they taught me not to cry when I got hurt playing with them. And take it like a man, and don't, don't tell mom and dad, you know, that kind of stuff. But when they had to do their thing, they had to do their homework, and I still wanted to play, <clears throat> They, they like to have their own space, and their rooms were off-limits to me. But I, I was a smart kid. I, I, I learned how to pick locks. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> and how many of you remember in the 70s and 80s, they had these doors, I think they still do, those emergency locks that you put on children's doors, got that little pinhole? Yes. Well... <clears throat> I didn't know what it was for, but I just was bored because I was trying to get in their room one afternoon or evening. And uh, I took a flashlight, looked in there, and there was a little piece of metal that was a tab. So I bent a hairpin and, oh, I can get in. <laughs> and I love to do one thing above all else when they were trying to do their homework or talking to their girlfriends on the phone or writing love letters, whatever they were doing. I wanted to play. I loved my brothers, and I loved to play with them anytime I wanted. So what I would do is I would, I would hold the doorknob so they wouldn't rattle. And I'd pull down hard and then make that thing click and take my time spinning the knob. But I also came equipped. I came equipped with a little squirt gun. And I would run in as fast as I can, surprise, and blast them. And it didn't matter what they were holding at the time or doing. I would, you know, put water on everything and they'd <laughs> try to catch me if you can. And I remember a few times I'd run into mom's room and mommy, 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 they're going to hurt me. They're going to hurt me. Why are they doing this? He, he, he. And they'd be so mad. Ah, oh, he's broken our room again. He's got us wet. And I just would revel in the moment. I loved it. You know, that's what family's for, right? <clears throat> And I was called a few names. Pest comes to mind. Pest comes. He's, he's pestering us. He's pestering us. He won't quit. He just doesn't give up. And I thought that was the best, you know? Well, the, the title of the sermon today is called to be a holy pest. And, and the secretary was kind of thoughtful enough to double check. Are you pest? Is that right? Oh, okay, that's true. Yes. I, I, I'm going to make a case for us to pester 
Um, not each other, but to pastor the Lord. So I hope that that's what you get away from this sermon. I want you to learn to love to bug Jesus because that's what he's calling us to do. So let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open up your word this morning, uh, we need you. We want to hear your word. And we want to leave this, uh, this time together with you with increased faith, a stronger heart, and a fire in our stomach, Lord, to pray without ceasing, to not give up, to not give in, because of who you are. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, there's very few parables uh, that I'm aware of that Jesus uh, didn't leave you hanging as to, as to what it meant. And the, the few that we're going to go through this morning are those where he just spelled it out fat blank. This is what I mean. I hope um, that you hear that this morning. So turn with me, if you would. And I didn't bring a PowerPoint, so we've got to do it old-fashioned style. Get your Bibles out, or your phones, or your tablets, what have you. And we're going to read together. Amen? As a family. There we go. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 through 8. Luke 18, 1 through 8. Here we go. So he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's pretty blunt. I'm telling you this so that you will always pray and not give up. Hmm. There we go. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected him. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, Hmm. Though I neither fear God nor respect man. And I'm reading from uh, ESV, by the way, if you're wondering what I'm reading from. But yet this widow keeps bothering me. I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Now, you might think that that's language that's a little too strong. But wait till we get into the Greek. He uses some pretty colorful adjectives. <clears throat> and the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is a, this is a moment of clarity between Jesus uh, and his followers. He really wants to make sure that they get a few things absolutely dead on straight. He wants them to pray how often? All the time. That doesn't mean every moment of the day without ceasing and you know being a hermit and being unproductive. That's, that's not what it's about. Um, from my understanding, uh, reading the culture about the time and uh, prayer is they had certain times during the day to pray. They set aside special time, and they prayed. That's what he's talking about. You pray without breaking your prayer habits. Build good prayer habits, but when you have them, don't stop. Be faithful. And do it without ceasing or without losing your heart. Well, let's go back and let's start in verse 2. This judge in a certain city... Who never, who didn't fear God nor respect man. Now, at that time, there was only really two positions that held a lot of respect amongst the culture. The priests, right? And the judges. And these people were to be public servants par excellence. And so what Christ is doing here is, 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 is getting people's, uh, ire up. Who likes a corrupt judge? Nobody. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've, is it Judge Brown? Did you guys see in the news? Yeah. He got five days in jail. I forgot for what. Contempt of court or something. But that made the news because that's a judge. Oh, he's going to get what he deserves. Five days isn't much, you know. <clears throat> but 
Judges hold a special place in our in any society. It doesn't matter what culture or color you're from. We all have judges. We all have a civil code that we have to live and abide by, right? Well, this guy was corrupt. And so people's attention were already caught. Oh, a bad judge? This is going to be good. Keep it on, Jesus. Bring it, bring it. Then there was a widow. And the widow is, is um, in, in that day and in, in time, it was the weakest of, of society, orphans and widows. Because if, if, their, if their, as their husband died and didn't explicitly leave them wealth and property, they're out. They have nothing. And they would have to go to court if they had children with this man and battle the in-laws for house and property. That's, that was, well, we would say that's messed up. Right? So, he starts this parable by, by talking about the most respected and powerful position in society and the least. A judge and a widow. Who had the power? The judge. Who had no power? The widow. All right. Now he, he breaks it down even more. He re emphasizes just how bad this man was. In his reflections, he admits to himself that I don't respect God and I certainly don't respect man, but this woman is bugging me. You can just imagine it. He's walking through town and this lady is on his heels, stepping on his feet no less. Judge! Making a scene, screaming, pulling on his cloak. Give me justice! I'm going to make this look ugly. And he's trying to get to the coffee shop. He's trying to get home. He's trying to duck in the car, slam the door, roll up the windows, and she's not quitting for weeks on end. The town is talking. Everybody knows this is happening. He's got to do what? Justice or preserve his inner peace? What do you think? <laughs> he has to dispense justice for his personal peace. He acts justly out of corruption. Mm. Ooh. All right. Now let's get into the Greek. I said I, I said there's some fun words, and I'm not kidding. All right, so this is verse 4 and 5. Uh, For he refused... Yes, verse 5. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so she will no longer beat me down by her continual coming. All right, so keeps bothering me is from pareko and kopos. Now together, these words loosely uh, translate this. It says to cause or happen to be brought about, uh, to make happen. So this is, a, this is an action verb. This woman was making this happen. She was forceful. All right? Kopos, the second part of this word, is the state of discomfort, distress, trouble, difficulty. In the original word for this, the meaning at that time was beating. <laughs> you, Jesus wasn't playing. This woman was... Verbally abusive, <laughs> persistent. She was a pest, right? She did not give up. She didn't care about her reputation. She didn't care about uh, what people would say about her. What did she single-mindedly want? Justice. justice. Give me that justice. I'll do anything for it. Now, when he talked about wearing me out, and I like the ESV because it's a little more, a little more. Uh, Blunt and accurate. The word is hupazoizo. It's a funny word. But it says, give, this is directly what it means. Give a black eye or to strike in the face. What he's trying to get at is this was going to escalate. If he didn't do something, she's going to get physical. This woman was off the chain. She was in his face, and some would say up in his grill. There was no way he was going to avoid this any longer. He couldn't pay her off. That's not what she wanted. She didn't want money. She wanted what? Justice. Give me justice. I don't want cash. I don't want a bribe. I want justice. All right. Six. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. He wants you to make sure that you got explicitly what he's trying to divulge about this corrupt judge. Sometimes in our life, in the round of our, our, our church life or our public life, um, we're going to find that we don't get justice much. 
people that we seek justice from, we just might not get it, or we might not think we'll get it. But think about this. Even a corrupt judge in this parable will dispense justice if pushed. Yeah? That's, that's, that's pretty powerful. Even though we can complain about our government, right, our leaders, some of them are bought and sold, that's undeniable, right? I saw a fun meme the other week on Facebook or something where uh, all the senators should wear like NASCAR jackets. Who bought them, right? All the stickers and labels of who donated to their campaigns. It doesn't matter what party you're from. They're all bought and sold. We all admit it. Well, so where's the hope? Why should we go to the voting box and vote anyway? If they're all bought and sold, what does it matter? Well, I hope that, I hope, <laughs> I hope that Jesus' parable from long ago will give you renewed faith in justice, right? Because even corrupt men can make good decisions if you push them right, right? If you push them right. Well, that's not the big point in this parable, but it's a side issue. So we all know at the end uh, who he wants you to identify with. Whom is, whom is the judge in the scheme of things? He compares it to God. Now, you ask a child if, if that's the way that we should understand the parable, and the child says, no, God's not corrupt. And the child would be right. Um, Jesus often uses a, a comparison, or he teaches from hyperboles, or it's called the lesser to greater. If a corrupt judge can give justice, then imagine if you bug God this hard, what he'd do for you. That's where he's coming from. He wants you, to, he first he irritates you. Oh no. How he, he draws you into the parable, a corrupt judge. You know, put on your thinking cap. Where are you in this scene? And then he does something that irritates you, it, it offends you. And then he makes a direct comparison to God. You are drawn in, bought and sold. You are in this parable. It's a fascinating way of teaching, and people never forgot it. That's why there was witnesses that could write down stuff long afterwards, right? So he uses a lesser to greater uh, tact in his parable. And God is, is good. He does respect and love man, right? He wants to hear your pleas. Now, what about this widow? What does he really... The thrust of this isn't to illuminate uh, the goodness of God. It's to illuminate something about his disciples. What does he want in their life again? It starts off in verse 1. I'll read it again. And he told them a parable to the effect that they might always pray and not lose heart or give up. When I first gave my life to God, I was on fire, excited, wanted to do anything uh, for him, and I, I, I went into Bible working, and I spent time up in uh, Portland, Oregon. How many of you familiar with Portland, Oregon? All right, all right. It's a nice city. Um, we worked in a part of the town that was not so nice, and uh, Portland earned these, I, I would see these bumper stickers, and it said, keep Portland weird. <laughs> what? Why, why, <laughs> what? Well, Portland is a, an eclectic city. And they have their own culture and their own thing. And I met all kinds of people. And as you, some of you have maybe been a Bible worker or a car porter or a door to door salesman, when you go door to door, you know that some communities are kind of uniform, right? Kind of, after a while, you kind of, well, if you're bored and by yourself, you kind of, I guess this person is going to be like this. But in Portland, I never had that. Every door was different. It felt like home, San Fernando Valley. So, I identified with them, you know, and uh, there was one woman who blew my mind. I'd never met anybody like this. She, uh, I did my thing. We did, we were doing surveys to, to find if anybody wanted to study the scriptures. And she says, yeah, I've got a, I've got a master's in divinity and from, from, I think she said Berkeley or Stanford. I forgot whether, which one. And I said, oh, really? So, so tell me what you love about God. She says, well, there's not much. Um, I went, oh. She's like, oh, but no disrespect. You know, I, you do your thing, you know. 
She'd say, but if, if you could, could you, could you pray for me? Well, yeah, I could at least do that. She said, well, I'm not going to buy books from you. I'm not going to do studies. Fine. Would you like me to visit you every time I'm, I'm out here? Yeah, that'd be nice of you. So I did. So as the weeks went by, um, she, she divulged kind of her initial comment. And she said, you know, I went through a really tough time in my life. And I wanted strength. I wanted specifically, I wanted strength for my situation. And that's all I prayed. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and God didn't give it. And then I was done. I gave up. He wasn't going to give it. And since a good God didn't give me what I needed, there is no God. And that's kind of where I'm at. Well, that's pretty good logic, I suppose. You know, I, I, you know, personally, I don't believe that. That's not my experience. She said, well, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm going to try to make you an atheist like I am now. That's, that's good, but at least we can be friends, and I promise that I'll pray for you. Yeah, yeah, you, you do that. Sure, sure, sure. And I'd like to say there was a happy ending, but that's kind of the way it was with her until the, the meeting was over, and, and I kind of left. And I confess, I stopped praying for her, because I forgot. Out of sight, out of mind. But when I got into ministry as a pastor, um, those conversations with her never left me. And I, I remember... Uh, she wasn't, she was funny, but she was sincere too. She really was disappointed. She wanted to experience something from God. She wanted deliverance uh, from his strength, right? And I figured that, you know, I, I wish I could have said something different. I wish I was more equipped. And I think I know a little bit more. And maybe if I've met somebody again, kind of in her situation, I might share this very verse or others with him, but I can't say that I'm very different from her. Have you ever prayed long and hard on something and after a while just kind of stopped? I have. When I read these, uh, these verses in Luke, these hit me hard because I have done something that Christ tried to really make sure was buttoned down before he, he went away from his disciples. He didn't want them to quit in prayer. He didn't want their faith to, to shrink. He knew what was coming down the pipe for them. Most of the disciples had uh, an exciting life in ministry, but they had all troubles. They had a lot of pain, a lot of loss. Um, most of Paul's letters are super exciting and happy to read, but then he slips in some of the realities. And you're, whoa, <laughs> that's what life's like? I don't know if that's what I'd like to do. But it, he always closes, but I'd do it again. I'd do it a thousand times over because Christ is so amazing. And Paul learned the secret, continual prayer. I'm not sure that maybe most of you are aware, um, one of my favorite writers, uh, and I hope maybe, maybe yours too, as um, Oswald Chambers and uh, Andrew Murray. And they have a lot of fantastic things on, on prayer. One of the, the quotes that I've, I've never forgotten is, if you want to gauge your faith, take a pulse on your prayer life. I'll say it one more time. If you want to gauge how big your faith is, take a pulse of your prayer life. Are you praying faithfully? Are you praying not just every day, but the prayers that you have been praying, did you quit? Have you stopped? Are, are people that you've been praying for or praying for yourself, have you noticed that it's not as strong as it used to be? And what Christ wants to make sure is that the disciples know that this is something that they can always check themselves with. Because there's a direct correlation with the quality and quantity of your prayers and your faith. It's Prayer is, is your direct, intimate connection with the Almighty. And I hope I get a big amen from that. Amen. amen. All right. And if, and if we are getting lost in life, whether through joys or pains or just distractions, the effect is the same. If our prayer life is slowly shrinking, right? Our faith in direct proportion is shrinking too. Don't take my word for it. Take his. There's, an, there's another parable just before this one. Um, I'm sure you are familiar with it. It's Luke 11. Now, 
you guys have wonderful children in this church, some very brave ones. And I, I love, I'm, of course, a youth minister at Camarillo, and I like to put my kids on the spot. And I usually have some that are always up to come up and do impromptu things. And I don't know, are there a few brave children that want to come up and do a skit with me? Or not? I'm not going to make you. It's okay. All right, come on up. Fantastic. This is one of my favorites. So let's turn to Luke 11, 5 through 13. This is a parable that's very similar to the one that we are discussing. Are you familiar with this one? Okay, this is, let's read it together. We're going to read it together. I'll read it, and then we're going to try to act it out. Because this is a fun, silly parable. And he said to them, and this is right after he taught them the Lord's Prayer, mind you. Which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within this house. Don't bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence... What's that word? What is? What are some of your versions read? Persistence. Persistence. Oh, he's a pest. Yeah, there we go. He will rise and give him whatever he needs. Not because he's a good friend, but because he wants to go to bed. Huh? Aha. Uh -huh. He acts out of selfishness. Doing something good. Yep. And I tell you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. For what father among you, if, he asks, if his son asks for a fish instead, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, he'll give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? It's the same type of parable. You see that it, you don't have to be over 30 years old to get this one, right? But this is a fun one to act. So who wants to be the annoying friend that knocks on the door? You, you got it. Come here. Let's do this. Let's stand up in front. Okay, so you're going to be on this side, and you're the guy in the house in bed with your kids. Okay? Okay, so you ready to do this? Now I want you to really be annoying. Can you do that? Uh -huh. <laughs> good, good, good. And I want you to really be grumpy. Is that good? Okay. So here we go. This is the first scene. You're going to run up to the door going, knock, 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 knock. No, knock, 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 knock. No. And you say, give me some bread. Give me some bread. <laughs> My friend's here, and I don't have any food. I don't have any food. All right, now you be grumpy, and you tell her to go away. <laughs> All right, now you got to, uh, since you're friends with them, and you, what do you want to call them? Bud? Buddy. 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 Right. Listen, buddy, I need bread. You give it to me now. I want bread. Buddy. Give me bread. All right, grumpy pants, what do you say back? Get away from my house. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, now you come at him again. Bang, bang, bang. All right, now you got to start thinking. She's not going away. She's going to keep you up all night. Where is my bread? All right, so what do you got? Are you going to give it to her nicely, or are you going to throw it out the window at her? I'd rather give you scorpion. <laughs> I'd rather give you a scorpion. Oh, he listens. <laughs> well, you just pretend you throw bread out the window and say, good night, go away. All right, very good. Give him a hand, guys. You can take your seat. So here again, we have Jesus uh, having uh, the people who do the justice or give the, the kind gifts, actually not very nice people doing the, the acts. And he uses this greater to better analogy of, well, if it can happen with jerks, right? Yes. yes. Well, come on, how good is God? Why don't you ask? Now, in my life, if... if if somebody asks me directly, why have I quit sometimes in prayer? I really don't. I can't put it into words. 
out of sight, out of mind. Um, people get on my nerves. I don't know. But there are some prayers that I have stopped, and I need to repent. And I have done, and I've started praying again for those people and for those situations. And you know what? God answered them. And I feel there's a part of me that feels bad. Things could have been different, maybe, if I was faithful. But in the same breath, because of my repentance and my hearing God's Word and knowing better, but coming back, asking for forgiveness and praying again, it's not that I made the change. God made the change, right? Amen? Amen? Here we go. Let's get to this troubling verse at the end. That's uh, Luke 18, doo -doo -doo. 8. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Well, there we go. How soon does he claim he answers prayer or justice? He says fast. But in the same breath, he says nevertheless or however. <clears throat> You know, why, why is everything qualified? <laughs> I want a simple, perfect faith that just, it's like you ask for one thing and you immediately get it. Well, I know that you mature Christians in this congregation understand that not every prayer is answered when you want it, right? Oh, amen to that. <clears throat> he says, nevertheless, uh, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This has troubled theologians for hundreds of years. Why does he say this? If God is so good and his promises are so perfect, and if people just claim these things, then there should be tons of faith when he returns. Well, there's always a weak link in the relationship with God and humans. The weak link is always humans. You read the Old Testament, I'd hope you'd notice that. All the covenants, uh, who failed in the covenants? Did God ever fail? No, it's always man failing, right? The first chapter, Genesis, uh, first book in the Bible, Genesis 4, who fails? Adam, big time. His heart was so big for his wife that he failed to remember who was the first love of his life, right? With Cain and Abel, um, even though God spent specific, special time with Cain before he killed his brother, <laughs> he didn't reflect on that. He did it anyway, right? There's things about being a human after paradise that we're broken. But just because we're broken doesn't change who God is or what he's promised to do. He knows that we're going to fail. He knows that we're going to be faithless in prayer. He knows that. But that's why he gave us these parables. That's why he set it up front. Very similarly to, to the conversation he had with Cain, we have very similar intent in the Gospels. These parables were directed not at the general populace. They were directed at his specific team, his disciples. I'm telling you this because I know what's going to happen to you. And I want you to know that if you don't give up, if you have the mindset of you just bug the Lord for all you've got, don't you believe I'll respond to you? Don't you think I'll do something? Are you, are you really saying that if things get tough and beyond your imagination tough, you think I'm too far away? Hmm. It can happen. Saints can lose their perspective and their, their faith can weaken in God. It can happen. I don't like to say that much. I don't want to tell anybody these realities, but we know it, right? Just reflect on your own life. But the promise is this. The promise is in the fact that he gave this parable. He knows our hearts. He knows our capacity for wandering. And he knows that if you remember something, maybe this parable will always stick in your head. 
he put these parables that are as odd as they may be and as irritating as they might uh, come across to you, they're meant to stick. And when you have moments of wanting to give up on something or somebody in prayer, just remember how he put it in his parables. Do you remember that corrupt judge or that grumpy neighbor? Even faithless jerks do justice. Huh? What more can the church of God do with God? Amen? Amen. When we're tempted, when we have reached our wit's end with whatever we're praying about, take him at his word. Pick up these two parables. Put them to memory. He will come through for you in his own time. And things will be strengthened, better, more than you've ever imagined. Amen? Now, I've been asked to make an offering call, right? Now, today's offering is for the church budget. And I'm sure that everyone appreciates air conditioning. Amen? Amen. Yes. Um, I thank you for letting me preach without a coat on this morning. <clears throat> but... One of the things that we can do to show our faithfulness and our love for God is in our tithes, right? Um, church budget should never be uh, something that we are, are dismissive of. And I hope that you return to God from a good heart, a heart that has learned to trust Him in all things. And uh, may His Word stick with you not just this week, but forevermore. He wants us to be faithful in prayer at all times. And when we do get a little, well, tired, our hearts grow weary, remember these funny stories that he gives us. Because it's true. If God is who he is, more justice, more love, more peace, more power will be poured out through our small faith in who he is.